And hello there! I'm Funky Monkey, and welcome to another edition of Funky Monkey at the Movies. Once again, my nameless producer is not with me. And yesterday, I went to see Avengers Infinity War. Yes folks, this one's the big one, because oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well, I'll leave you a little spoiler space here, so if you haven't seen it, or if it's too soon and you want to go and see it without being spoiled, press your stop button now. of you oh my goodness okay this 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 was mind blowing this 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 was out of there this was out of this world i'm almost speechless now you all know if you've been paying attention to all this that originally this was going to be two parts of the movie that it was going to be infinity war part 1 and infinity war part 2 then they just made it Avengers Infinity War, and the untitled sequel. Well, somebody neglected to add that to the movie itself, because... Yeah, this is a massive spoiler, but I've already put in the spoiler warning, so... It just ends at the moment that Thanos has won. He's finally gotten all of the Infinity Stones. Thor comes in, grievously wounds him, but Thanos at least survives long enough to retreat through a Space Stone portal. And then, people start fading away into ash. Half the universe, dead. That can kind of have an effect on people. If people just fade into nothingness. I mean, they even show it in the post credit scene. There's no mid credit scene, how could there be? Nothing funny about half the universe being noped out of existence. Because some of those people might be airplane pilots. And one minute, you're a pilot. Flying along, nothing wrong, people are going somewhere. The next minute, maybe you and your co-pilot, the entire cockpit staff, completely gone. There's nobody flying the plane. It might just glide along for a bit, but then, crash. And if you're lucky, you might ditch into the ocean. But if you're not, you'll be over land, and then that's going to cause a massive disaster and even more chaos. But that's one thing. After all this, it is supposedly shown to us that he cared about Gamora, his daughter, his foster daughter. They even include a flashback to him first adopting her. Adopting there a word that I'm using quite wrongly. But you know, it's not really kidnapping because he decides that he wants to go along with them for whatever reason. And then of course Nebula turns up. Now, Nebula's had an interesting arc, actually, over the course of the movies. In the first one, Hughes, the dragon, if you will, the uh, secondary villain to Ronan the Accuser. Ronan ends up getting destroyed at the end of that first movie, but Nebula escapes. And then in the second movie, she finally tracks down Gamora and they have this massive knockdown drag out fight. And finally, when Nebula finally gets the upper hand, she doesn't go for the kill. And just proclaims that she wins, and she's finally better than Gamora. And it's sort of the start of a massive healing arc for her. Which is unfortunately massively curtailed here, because, you know, event. Which is what they've been building to the whole time. Like, since the culmination of Phase 1, they started the long road towards this. Well, not even this, because this is only one step away from the next part of this movie. Well, the next movie, which is going to be the final part of this story, and start opening up the world to the next set of stories, which is going to be something interesting. And that's coming next year. But... 
Well, I'll tell you something here. When I came out of the cinema, when I came out of the screen, my heart was racing. They can't end it there. It was running through my mind the whole time. But I just knew. Part of me knew. Because it was so big and so expansive. I tried to cram in so much that I knew that they weren't going to get it done in one movie. I knew that, you know, they, he wasn't going to get all of the stones, do what he was going to do, and then have it undone in a two, two and a half hour runtime. I don't know that of late it hasn't been diminishing returns, but they've never really had a completely bad movie. Like, just an absolute dud. Not in my opinion, anyway. I mean, if my nameless producer was here, he might have an opinion on whether or not that kind of thing is going. I'm doing this now because it's thematically a thing. Because, you know, half the universe is gone at the end of this movie, and uh, half of the podcast team is not here for the podcast about this movie. This movie affected me. But yeah, let's talk about these characters and the interactions and... The snark just went to an entire other level, with Spider-Man and Iron Man riffing off each other. And I did really love the new Iron Man suit, the uh, nanotech Iron Man suit. And it brought Bruce back to Earth again. So you had Tony Stark and Stephen Strange and Bruce Banner and dear old Peter Parker. And they winded up being not on Earth anymore. And there's Thor. There's Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy. And Rocket and Groot who end up on Earth. By the end of the movie, there's like two groups. Well, let's get to the other thing. I mean, I don't know that they succeeded, but they tried to put in a, a romance here between Vision and the Scarlet Witch. And... I mean, I'm not much of one for a romance about between characters. I'm not, you know, much of a guy who does romance stuff. But... Yeah, I don't know that it works that well. I mean, it hasn't really been developed, but you can't really develop something when these characters have had so little screen time over the last two or three movies. I mean, when was the last time outside of Captain America Civil War that you saw the Scarlet Witch? Way back in Age of Ultron. They barely spent any time at all together on screen. My point is that it hasn't really been set up. I mean, I know that time has gone on and that, but, you know, I would have liked to have seen it being set up, it having been shown as romance blossoming between these two characters. As it was, we're just told that they're in love because it happened in the comics. And, of course, because in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Vision's origin is tied to that Mind Stone on his forehead. So you can imagine what happens when uh, Thanos tries to get the Mind Stone. Well, when Thanos gets the Mind Stone. And yeah, he does actually end up getting them all. So this was always going to be where the final stone was revealed. It was never going to be shown in any time before it because we already knew where the others were. The Power Stone was in the... Novacore secure basement facility. The reality stone, the ether, was with Tanalia Tivan, the collector. The space stone was with Loki the whole time. The mind stone was on Vision's brow. The time stone was the eye of Agamotto around Doctor Strange's neck. So that just left the soul stone, which turned out to be on some world or other with a big old drop. And for you to get the Soul Stone, you had to give up a soul that you loved. Let's talk about something else here. The music. Because this is something I want to get to. Much love for Alan Silvestri, who did the score for this one. But it was very much about the kind of villain chords. Very sort of minor and intimidating chords. And then the sort of slow and lossy layered violins and moroseness for when he'd finally done it, for when Thanos had finally wiped out half the universe and brought balance to everything. I mean, yeah, there were echoes of the Avengers theme when uh, 
characters were revealed and that. But, yeah, for the most part, I felt that the, well, predictable villain chords and workmanlikeness of it, it just did kind of bring it down a notch or two. I like to be challenged in my musical tastes. I like to have something fits the pictures, but isn't just something that I've heard so many times before. I like to have something that's new, maybe dramatic, but not villainous for a villain. Maybe a musical score that tries to sympathise with a villain a little bit, but not, like, to a massive extent. But no, this one was all villain chords and sadness. It wasn't as great. Right, well, it's time to put it on the ladder. Because now we have a ladder, because we have two films. Final thoughts, then. It's another pulse-pounding adventure in the mighty Marvel tradition, but this film, more than any other, suffers from middle film syndrome. So, we can construct a ladder, now, with Black Panther and Avengers Infinity War, which brings us to the question of whether this is better or worse than Black Panther. And this time I can't actually speak for my nameless producer, but for me... I might actually put this one below Black Panther. And I liked Black Panther. I really liked Black Panther. It was funny, it was action-packed, it featured M'Baku of the Jabari. It was just a great movie. And this one is good. This one is uh, the culmination of everything, but, you know, middle film syndrome, it just brings everything down a bit. Official ranking ladder, as of April 27th, 2018, the superhero movie ladder, for me, at least, goes Black Panther and then Avengers Infinity War. Okay, so this has been Funky Monkey for Funky Monkey at the Movies, and all of the e-begging links are below. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at the movies!